taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. David Berkowitz Son of Sam David Berkowitz was actually born, Richard David Falgo, on 1 June 1953, in Brooklyn, New York, USA. A few days after his birth however, his mother gave him up for adoption, and the young boy was taken in by Nathan and Pearl Berkowitz. The Berkowitzes were a childless Jewish American couple, who ran a modest hardware store in the Bronx. They switched their new son's four and middle names around, and David Richard Berkowitz was now his official title. David's childhood was normal by most acceptable standards, and the Berkowitzes doted on the boy. Neighbors would call him spoiled however, and also state that he had an aggressive, bullying streak. Though it never appears that this became a great concern, his parents did however seek specialist help, to try and control his rambunctious nature. In 1967, David's adoptive mother Pearl Berkowitz lost her life to cancer, he was only 14 at the time. This appeared to have a profound impact, making the boy sullen and uncooperative. It also intensified his pyromania and interests in petty crime. When his adoptive father Nathan remarried, David didn't get on with his father's new wife, and so their relationship became strained to the point it was almost non-existent. Eventually Nathan and his new wife moved out to Florida, USA. It has been suggested that this further destabilized his delicate adolescent mind as it was around now that the first signs of self-delusion were beginning to appear. In his earlier years it is also known that Berkowitz had dabbled with a few religions. Mainly up until the tragic death of his mother, which shook his faith to the core, and from which he never recovered. Alongside this resentment, the son of Sam would also claim later that the rejection from his birth mother was an instigator in his rampage. However this appears to be untrue. In the 1970s, David Berkowitz made contact with his birth mother and half-sister, but lost interest and ceased visiting them. Not quite the out-and-out -out rejection he feels justified his devilish acts so adequately. In 1971, David Berkowitz joined the army where he turned out to be a very proficient marksman. Also during his three-year stint, he lost his virginity to a prostitute, catching a venereal disease from the incident. This would form more deep resentment towards society, and would be the trigger for many arson attacks around the city. In 1974, Berkowitz received an honorable discharge from the U.S. Army. Berkowitz then had a series of blue-collar jobs and doesn't appear to have been any trouble up until December of 1975. Although in a letter to his father, cracks were beginning to appear in his sanity, as the delusions were increasing in severity. The people, they are developing a hatred for me. You wouldn't believe how much some people hate me. Many of them want to kill me. These delusions would soon become uncontrollable. In 1975, David Berkowitz became somewhat of a recluse, only venturing out to buy essential groceries all the while his paranoia growing. He would later claim that this was the time when he first started hearing the demon urging him to kill. Eventually the voices built up enough of a momentum and Berkowitz went out to do their bidding on the 24th of December, Christmas Eve in New York. Taking out a hunting knife with him, Berkowitz stabbed two victims that night, one of them has never come forward, and the other was teenager Michelle Foreman. Although the young girl would end up in hospital with her injuries, she wouldn't die. Although this was only the son of Sam getting started. Seven months later on July 29, 1976, David Berkowitz decided to go back out on the prowl. This time taking in the sights of Pelham Bay, Bronx, New York. 18-year-old Donna Loria and her friend, Jody Volanti, 19 were talking in Jody's parked car that night and were told to come inside by Loria's bemused parents. This was due to the late hour. The two girls carried on their conversation for a short while and just as Loria was about to leave, a stranger appeared at the passenger side of the vehicle. 
Before they even had chance to scream, the man had pulled a .44 Bulldog handgun from a paper bag and fired. Jody was hit in the thigh and would survive her injuries, Don Deloria on the other hand was shot fatally, and no matter how much her father tried to save her, she would die on the way to the hospital. When investigators poured over this case, they worked on a few theories, not knowing a serial killer was in their midst. The first theory centered on jealousy. Don Deloria was a popular girl, and also some of her ex-boyfriends had organized crime connections. The other theory focused on the killer's stance when he fired, noting that it could possibly be law enforcement due to the controlled firing position. The investigators decided to focus on the former. It would only be another three months before David Berkowitz would rear his ugly head again, this time in Flushing, Queens, New York. On the night of the 23rd of October 1976, Carl DeNaro, 25, and Rosemary Keenan, 28, were sat in a parked car after an enjoyable night when the windows shattered and the car exploded. Keenan didn't need any second warnings and accelerated away immediately, not knowing that the attack had been focused on them. The pair actually thought that they had been caught up in some crossfire. Carl DeNaro was taken to the hospital and had to have part of his skull replaced with a metal plate due to his injuries. Keenan walked away with minor lacerations from the smashing glass. As Keenan's father was a 20-year veteran police detective in the night, no stone was left unturned in the case. Unfortunately, all the stone turning led to nowhere and the crime wasn't linked with the earlier shooting as they were in different boroughs. They did however, retrieve the .44 bullets from the scene, but they were determined to be too mangled to be of any forensic use. On the 26th of November that same year, only just over a month later, Berkowitz would strike again. Donna DeMossi, 16, and her friend, 18-year-old Joanne Lamino, were chatting outside Lamino's house in Belarus, Queens. Suddenly a man in military fatigues approached them in an urgent fashion. Upon his approach, he appeared to ask the girls a question, can you tell me how to get, before pulling out a gun and firing indiscriminately at the frightened bear. The shots were wild and one struck Donna in the throat, but missed any major artery and exited her body cleanly. Joanne Lamina wasn't as lucky however. She escaped with her life but one of the bullets rendered her a paraplegic. The rest of the gunshots struck the apartment building itself. An interesting point here is that a neighbor spotted a blonde man leaving the scene with a gun in his left hand, David Berkowitz has dark hair. The new year of 1977 brought a fresh new attack. On January 30, Christine Freund and John Deal, aged 26 and 30 respectively, were sat in Deal's vehicle in the early hours after watching the hit movie Rocky. Suddenly, as they were talking, gunshots rained down upon them shattering the windshield and Deal immediately drove off for help. Unfortunately, during the fracas, Christine had been struck in the head. She would die in hospital hours later. It was during this investigation, where there were even more .44 bullets fired that police first began to realize that the earlier shootings were possibly linked. Also they theorized, that the killer's main targets were women with long dark hair, and released composite images of the dark-haired suspect in the Lori Valandi case, and the blonde suspect from the Demasi Lomino one. It appeared that law enforcement were looking for multiple suspects. With the detectives of the night floundering, Berkowitz was a free man able to keep up his reign of terror, and so he did. On the 8th of March, 1977, Virginia Voskirkian was returning home from college classes in the affluent area of Forest Hills Gardens, when she was approached by David Berkowitz. As he approached her traveling in the opposite direction, he pulled the gun from his pocket and aimed. Virginia never stood a chance as she raised her books in a vain attempt at self-preservation. The .44 caliber round passed straight through the books, and into her face, killing her instantly. 
During his escape, Berkowitz was seen by a few witnesses who had come out after hearing the gunshot, they would describe him as dark-haired, clean-shaven, chubby, and a teenager. After this crime, law enforcement announced to the people of New York that they had found a link between the Loria and Voskirchian murders. On the 10th of March, they stated that the same .44 gun was used in each incident. Although it was later found out that this evidence was far from conclusive, the officials were now looking in the right direction. Just over a month later and the now notorious killer was doing his rounds once more. On the 17th of April in the Bronx, not far from the Donna Loria murder, Valentina Suriani and Alexander Ressal were making out in a parked car. Sometime around 3 a.m., another vehicle pulled up alongside theirs and started firing bullets. Both Alexander and Valentina were shot twice, with Valentina dying at the scene, and Alexander succumbing later in the hospital. Although none of the victims were able to give a witness statement in this case, the bullets were deemed to be a match, and police reignited the public interest in the case. It was also around now that police decided they were only seeking the composite suspect from the Loria murder, all others that had been described were only sought as witnesses. Near to the bodies of Suriani and S.A. was a piece of evidence that would go down in serial killer history, as one of the most interesting and strange pieces to have been collected. Second only to the Dear Jack letters, the letter David Berkowitz left has inspired writers and movies the world over. Here is the Son of Sam letter in its entirety. I am deeply hurt by your calling me a women hater. I am not. But I am a monster. I am the Son of Sam. I am a little breath. When Father Sam gets drunk he gets mean. He beats his family. Sometimes he ties me up to the back of the house. Other times he locks me in the garage. Sam loves to drink blood. Go out and kill commands Father Sam. Behind our house some rest. Mostly young, raped and slaughtered, their blood drained, just bones now. Papa Sam keeps me locked in the attic, too. I can't get out but I look at the attic window and watch the world go by. I feel like an outsider. I am on a different wavelength than everybody else, programmed to kill. However, to stop me you must kill me. Attention all police, shoot me first, shoot to kill or else. Keep out of my way or you will die. Papa Sam is old now. He needs some blood to preserve his youth. He has had too many heart attacks. Too many heart attacks. Ugh, me hoot it hurt sonny boy. I miss my pretty princess most of all. She's resting in our lady's house but I'll see her soon. I am the monster, Beelzebub, the chubby behemoth. I love to hunt. Prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat. The women of Queens are the prettiest of all. I must be the water they drink. I live for the hunt, my life. Blood for Papa. Mr. Borelli, sir, I don't want to kill any more no sir, no more but I must, honor thy father. I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't belong on earth. Return me to Yahoo's. To the people of Queens, I love you. And I want to wish all of you a happy Easter. May God bless you in this life and in the next and for now I say goodbye and good night. Belize, let me haunt you with these words, I'll be back. I'll be back. To be interpreted as, bang, 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 ugh. Yours in murder Mr. Monster. From this new lead came fresh impetus. Detectives liaised with psychologists, who in turn said that officers were hunting for a paranoid schizophrenic, probably one with grand illusions and who believed that they were possessed by demons. They also stated that this would undoubtedly leave him a loner, who had never had a meaningful, stable, relationship. On May 30, 1977, another letter would surface this time addressed to daily news reporter Jimmy Breslin. In it the ramblings are very similar to the first one, only laid out in a more articulate fashion. He also asks what will you have for July 29th? This struck officers as an ominous threat, 
as it was also the anniversary of the Loria shooting, and only two months away. In this note he also promises to buy all officers working the case new shoes when they catch him, if, I can get up the money. Son of Sam. With this new letter and the veiled threat, tensions were increasing in New York City. The women got their hair cut in huge numbers, and I ran out in the shops as they tried to change their image in the hope of protection. The city was living in fear. It was the 26th of June before David Berkowitz decided to terrorize the people of New York again. This time his victims were a young couple who had just left the Alphys discotheque, Sal Lupo, 20, and Judy Blachetto, 17. As they sat in their vehicle about 3 a.m., three shots were fired through the car that struck both of them. Fortunately their injuries were minor and they made full recoveries. They also didn't get a look at the perpetrator, although witnesses reported a tall dark-haired stocky man and a blonde man with a mustache, both making their way away from the scene. The police implicated that the blonde man was only a witness, and the suspect was the dark-haired stocky man seen sprinting from the scene. Due to the upcoming anniversary on July the 29th, the city went into a state of panic. With officers even proposing that they sit plain clothed in vehicles with mannequins and wigs, hoping to lure their killer to them. In the end though, July the 29th passed without incident. It wouldn't be for very long however, as David Berkowitz was armed and ready to kill again on the 31st of July, just two days after. Stacy Moskowitz and her boyfriend Bobby Violante, two 20-year-olds had just been out to see a movie and were now enjoying some private time in their car, when Berkowitz showed up to proceedings. Shooting from the passenger side he struck both victims in the head. Stacy was to lose her life in hospital, and Bobby survived two shots to the face. Though he lost the sight in one eye and retains only a low amount of vision in the other. Unfortunately for David Berkowitz however, he left a trail of witnesses to this crime. With many of them flagging his vehicle as a yellow Volkswagen Beetle. Shortly after 2.35 am, a man who assumed the name Alan Marsters was driving through an intersection not far from the incident, when his car was nearly struck by a speeding yellow Volkswagen Beetle. Marsters followed the vehicle at high speed until he lost it in traffic, Though he described the driver and Violani later confirmed his description as someone he had seen moments before his shooting. Law enforcement didn't get hold of the Moskowitz Violanti incident until around 2.50 am, and even then they didn't link it to the others until they realized the large caliber rounds. During interviews with the witnesses, including Marsters, police determined that their suspect did indeed drive a yellow Volkswagen Beetle and they then deduced that there were 900 such cars in New York. Their intention was to track the owners of every single one. A few days after the Moskowitz Violante shooting, a local woman named Cassilia Davis came forward. On the night of the crime she had been out walking her dog when she had seen a yellow parked car being ticketed. Not long after the ticketing officer had left. A young man returned and appeared to observe Cassilia with some interest. Concerned that he had a dark object in his hand, Cassilia ran home only to hear shots ring out in the street behind her. After a couple of days she built up the courage to report the incident to police, who in turn checked their records of every car that was ticketed that night. Amongst the list of cars that had been ticketed in the area that night, was David Berkowitz's yellow Ford Galaxy. On the 9th of August, Nipe Detective James Eustace got in touch with his colleagues in Yankers and asked if they could arrange an interview with David Berkowitz. What he heard next shocked him, as his Yankers co-workers told him that Berkowitz may be the son of Sam himself as they suspected him of numerous strange crimes in their borough. Eustace had only intended to interview him as a witness, but now he felt there was a much bigger aspect to this and passed the information on to his seniors. On August 10, detectives were investigating Berkowitz's car when they spotted a rifle on the back seat. 
Searching the vehicle they also found a duffel bag that contained a considerable amount of ammunition, maps of the crime locations, and a threatening letter to the head of the Omega Task Force, Sergeant Dowd. Worried about the consequences of their search in regards to conviction, the detectives decided to scope out Berkowitz's car and wait for him to make a move. All the while they could wait on the search warrant to come through. At 10 p.m. the search warrant still had not arrived and David Berkowitz approached his vehicle. After he entered the car, Detective John Falotico approached the driver's side and raised his gun to David Berkowitz's temple. Detective Falotico would later talk of the disconcerting smile the killer bore in the situation. Almost as if he was gleeful, happy to be caught, like they were playing hide and seek. When he asked the driver who he was, he was told I'm Sam. Next to Berkowitz in his car at the time was a brown paper bag. That bag contained a .44 Bulldog handgun. After taking their suspect into custody, police made a search of David Berkowitz's apartment and found it to be covered in satanic graffiti on the walls. Also of note, was a bunch of diaries that Berkowitz had kept since the age of 21. These diaries held an extensive account of all the arson attacks he had committed over the years, with some sources stating there were over 1,400. On the morning of August the 11th, 1977, David Berkowitz quickly confessed to the shootings after only 30 minutes interrogation. During this confession Berkowitz claimed that his previous neighbor's dog had convinced him to kill. The black Labrador retriever owned by Sam Carr, had demanded the blood of pretty young girls, and was possessed by an ancient demon that issued irresistible commands. Berkowitz was just following orders. When it came to sentencing, David Berkowitz managed to send the court into near uproar by repeating Stacy was a whore, at audible levels throughout the proceedings. On June 12, 1978, David Berkowitz received a sentence of 25 years to life for each murder he had committed. These punishments are to run consecutively. In 1979, whilst in prison, an attempt was made on the life of the son of Sam. David Berkowitz had his neck slashed from front to back, requiring over 50 stitches. After the incident he refused to identify his attacker, stating only that it was the punishment that I deserve. As of 2017, David Berkowitz still resides at the disposal of the American prison system and guards regard him as a model prisoner, though he is still unlikely to ever be paroled.